Hey, my name is Ryan Haggerty. I'm here with the Warhol Academy, and we're doing another panel discussion kickoff for our capacity building workshop series. And we have three wonderful guests with us tonight. Uh, and we're going to be talking about hacking the project cycle. Uh, and we're coming at that through some different directions with some project management, uh, some scope of work management, as well as some marketing strategy and some thoughts on collaboration, because we all need to work together. <laughs> to get things done. So uh, basically, uh, this this whole discussion is, is kind of kicking off some trends some uh, topics and things that you might come across as you're like researching and get involved in these topics yourself. Uh, but it's also an introduction to these wonderful workshop instructors that you all can learn more about today and uh, sign up for their workshops as we get those events live for you to register for. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our first guest here. So uh, Garrett Cooper is actually teaching a set of workshops, but uh, his background primarily in project management, uh, and he's led agile teams to develop creative technology solutions for clients in manufacturing, education, finance, insurance, fundraising, and other growing sectors across the country. Uh, and if you go on his LinkedIn profile, you might note he is a lifelong learner and community builder. Uh, who has certifications in a lot of what he's teaching, which is focused on project management, as well as uh, he has some certifications and some tech things. Um, and then really, Garrett's not only uh, working with teams, but a little factoid I just wanted to share about him. Uh, he's co-founded Bootstrap and grown a web development team to a peak of 10 uh, and that generated over $2 million in revenue, and that was doing work with uh, offshore owners and contractors. Uh, and then as part of his give back uh, that he often does in this, his teaching capacity role, here is partnered with over 50 small businesses on strategic management, governance, fiscal, project management, product management, and fundraising initiatives as a consultant. So uh, he's very busy. Uh, he's actually not in Pittsburgh with uh, the rest of us here tonight, so we're lucky to have him. Uh, but welcome, Garrett. And uh, if you just wanted to share a few thoughts on what people can look forward to with your workshops. Sure. Um, thanks, Ryan, uh, Dennis, Nathan. Uh, glad to be uh, to be part of the panel this evening and uh, obviously teaching uh, alongside you all. Um, my uh, the workshops that I'm going to be teaching, I really sort of think about them as varying uh, uh, doing intensive. So we're going to be doing a lot of exercises, a lot of hands on stuff. Um, one, like learning the nitty gritty applications, uh, you know, how do we, how do we do budgeting, like do really good budgeting in Excel, for example, um, you know, how do we, uh, create project briefs, right. Do good briefs, uh, using docs, right. Some of the tools there. So we're going to be like micro and then we're going to go macro, um, and learn like, how do we work well and collaborate with others? I know that's kind of a theme, uh, Nathan's been thinking a lot about, but how do we work well with others, right? And putting a good process in place. And that's, I'm going to talk about Scrum um, as well uh, in one of my workshops. And the tool that we're going to use to organize Scrum is going to be a song. So it's very like micro macro, um, but it's very, it's very uh, practical. So nice. So we can look forward to uh, Garrett's workshops coming up and, and getting that toolkit as well as some of those collaboration tips so we can make our projects run more smoothly. Uh, and then next up, uh, we have Dennis Guy. Uh, so Dennis Guy, uh, when I first met Dennis, uh, he was running what's called First at Brewbox, which is a subscription box service along with his wife that they started in 2016. And we're going around to beer events, as you can imagine, with a name like First Sip Brewbox, uh, with beer swag items for beer fans to have within those boxes. Uh, and that's morphed over the years into another business, which is... Uh, First Sip Studios, which is actually a brick and mortar uh, digital marketing agency and content creation business, uh, where they now not only uh, still run the First Sip Brewbox service, but now they're taking on clients, working with small businesses, nonprofits, uh, you know, making a lot of cool things happen to get the word out about a lot of uh, organizations here in Pittsburgh. Um, and then uh, one interesting story that uh, they actually had a really cool collaboration with a local brewery here in Pittsburgh. And I believe it was the first women-owned brewery in Rwanda where they were able to kind of 
work on a beer collaboration that people are able to enjoy in uh, both, you know, here in the U.S. as well as uh, overseas. So, you know, obviously knowing how to ship things in boxes really helps with all that, as well as all the cool brand work that they get to work on. And then the final note uh, I'll, I'll give about Dennis here, uh, they actually run a program called uh, Serve Your Purpose SIP. You might notice a the beverage theme here, uh, where they're actually, him and his wife are doing instructional courses to help small business owners figure out marketing strategy and plans and things that they can do to help get their uh, digital story out online and carve out some real estate for themselves and their marketing. Uh, so welcome, Dennis. And uh, if you wanted to share just a little bit about that marketing strategy workshop and, and what people might look forward to. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much, Ryan. And uh, it's great to be amongst some some really esteemed folks on this panel as well. Uh, and sometimes I forget, Ryan, how long ago I've actually known you. <laughs> You've seen that transition over the last, you know, six, seven years um, that we've had and being able to grow from just my wife to being my wife and I and seven other folks on our team are really grateful for that. Uh, some of the things to look forward to in the workshop, we're doing bits and pieces of what we've done with our SIP program. Where we've had the ability of working with small to mid-sized businesses um, that range from fire departments to more smaller like fashion boutiques, coffee shops. We've really run the gambit of uh, folks that we've worked with the whole way up to like doing some local government work with municipalities. Um, but some of the stuff that we're pulling and bringing to this workshop, what we pride ourselves on from a business perspective, from running both a product driven side of our company where we had subscribers in nine different countries, um, and being now on the more of a the service side, we have the ability to put both hats on. So most businesses that are either in a program or are clients of ours, one big thing we talk about is business growth capacity. We look at their current reality, what roadblocks and obstacles that business is facing to getting to where they want to grow to, and how creative. Um, content creation can help bridge and overcome those obstacles from both a website and social media deployment aspect. So we help them figure out like where those gaps are and how to overcome those gaps with more of a tactical content creation um, methodology that we teach them. And the cool thing about that, that's going to show up differently for each and every business that we're mm -hmm. working with. Uh, but the important factor is we show them how to be sustainable and do it themselves, whether they have a team or not, because uh, the lack of knowledge can never be a barrier or an obstacle to deploying this content out there. The landscape's incredibly noisy. You have to continue to find ways of differentiating yourself and then knowing what your brand store and what your voice is. And we show them how to bring that to life. And more importantly as well, to know when is it best to like outsource different projects. So that's kind of what we're going to be going over in our uh, few different workshops that we're putting together. That sounds amazing. <laughs> we're thankful for your, your brain and your experience running your own businesses that you're now able to kind of impart upon others. So that's really cool. Um, and then last but not least, uh, we also have with us tonight, uh, Nathan Wadding. Uh, Nathan Wadding primarily runs uh, Skinny Time Media, or at least that's how I met him. I know he does some other consulting services as well. Uh, but thinking about, uh, you know, Dennis was just talking about some content creation and things like that. So if you go on Skinny Tie's site, you'll see a lot of example videos and sample work they've done from clients. But really, I think what sets the, their work apart a little bit is it's not only about clients understanding their own brand story, but when you think about the people that make up these organizations, they dig a little bit deeper into that experience and what some of their internal values are, their capacity, uh, ways to use storytelling to kind of make those processes run better. Uh, which is great because he's going to be teaching a workshop on collaboration coming up soon. So, uh, Nathan, thank you for joining us. And if you just wanted to, you know, share a little bit about collaboration and what people might look forward to with your workshop. Yeah, I was. I had something I wanted to say, but as as everyone was talking, I started <laughs> taking notes on how other things I wanted to say. So, as we all do in this room, we all have multiple ideas, and picking the one to run with is usually the hardest thing. So. Um, I'll start here. Um, I'm super fascinated with collaboration. Uh, we have a very collaborative company. I've been a lifelong collaborator um, my entire career of video production. 
uh, as a video editor and as a um, video producer. Uh, I always, I can't do everything. So I always relied on someone else to help me. And I love that part of it. I love it when you give a designer something, a framework, a concept, a creative brief, a project brief, and they bring you back something that you go, huh, I never thought about that. Or I never saw that. I never under, I never, never expected that. To me, there's magic in that process. There's magic in that, um, in that interaction and that collaboration. We at Skinny Tie, we collaborate with our clients. We typically sit on the same side of the table with them and we we co-create with them, whether it's our internal client that's actually paying us money or whether it's the employees of the company. We help co-create and guide the stories out of people because that's really the power. The power is the stories of the people, um, their individual stories that can help connect together. But my my fascination with collaboration, which is what we're going to focus on, is is really, I mean, if you think about it, When's the last time someone taught you how to play or work with someone else, right? I remember being in kindergarten or elementary school early on and you learning how to work or play or share with someone else, whether it's the crayons or a ball or sitting in a circle or not punching someone or hitting someone or kicking them. When when else as an adult did you ever learn how not how to behave with someone or how to interact with someone to get what you wanted, to get what needed to be done that day. We do it here. We just did a disc profile with everyone on the team and we all got in a room and learned everyone's profile. You get parts of it and you get peeks at it, but really when do we as individuals focus on how, how do I work with you? Um, how do we collaborate? I look at collaboration as a negotiation. Everything's in negotiation. It, it is not it is not rigid. It is not black and white. Everything is a negotiation of I can do this. You can do this. What can you take? How much of that can you do? And, and learning those that conversation around boundaries is so important. And I think now is is even more important than ever to really intentionally have a conversation about collaboration because post covid. We don't know where everybody we're all the three of us, the four of us are all over the place. We're not in the same room. So even using online tools and 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 collaborating, using whiteboards, using Word docs, using all of that stuff and project managers and the different roles on projects to complete tasks. How do we do how do we do that together and how do we exist it in relationship with each other? So that's what I'm fascinated about. So I, I hope there's some other interest there because I really want to scratch this itch for myself and try to lay out some time to think about it um, and do the homework that is needed to supply everybody with some knowledge here. So Nice. No, and I, I 100% agree on the collaboration aspect. Like uh, just in my past with uh, creating visual content, uh, I know you can collab on a team with photography, but I like photography because it often was something I could do on my own, whereas video was always, always, always some kind of collaboration going on, which, uh, you know, as you pointed out, can always make a process better. But if the process isn't running smoothly, it can also create problems because yeah. humans, humans, uh, you know, we bring our own unique set of problems. But yeah, <laughs> when it's working well, it definitely leads to something unexpected, which is really cool. Yeah. Um, so uh, we have all these wonderful brains here with these different backgrounds. And obviously, uh, People can go in a lot of different directions with uh, these roles that you all are, are working in and that we could be talking about right now. So let's maybe narrow it down a little bit and focus in on some of the things that you guys are currently focused on in your work. Uh, and I'll kind of popcorn this around. And uh, since Garrett, you started first, I would like to know uh, what is your current focus in your, your work that you do? Yeah, so uh, right now, I mean, basically, my my days are consumed with trying to uh, take Salesforce and make it into a true enterprise level application uh, for um, you know a hundred plus person insurance company uh, based out of Dallas uh, called Coverica, uh, and so you know the sales and marketing team have been using it for years, but now we're trying to fold in uh, accounting uh, and other sort of back office departments that. You know, traditionally haven't been part of Salesforce, right? And and you know, um, it's it's funny because early in my career, right, I sort of grew out of the open source code kind of movement, right, Ruby on Rails and a whole bunch of stuff. And Salesforce was always a little bit of the kind of you know Death Star, evil empire, um, you know, just because they were so big, right, and kept kind of gobbling up and acquiring companies and so forth. Um, but it, it it almost feels like to me right now, at least what I'm seeing is that. 
Salesforce is sort of like what Microsoft Office was, you know, back in the 90s and, and, and aughts, right? Where it's just like, it's, you know, it's just at some point, it's almost going to be every business's enterprise application um, is kind of the way things are moving. So anyway, right now, my, my life is running uh, a dev team um, that's working on putting a lot of those cost center uh, functionality into Salesforce that it's not quite like a straight level fit. Um, like sales and marketing is right because that's how it was designed. But again, that's just where all that's where really enterprises are moving toward. Um, and you know, uh, yeah, just basically trying to lead a team, implementing Scrum, you know, Agile, so forth, um, and building it out. So that's that's pretty much my days. No, that's interesting because you're working with a team to help entire departments of people uh, find something mm -hmm. valuable and accessible and learn how to use it. So you're not only hearing input from your team, but you've got all these departments that are just like information dump that you guys are having to go through. So when you think about project and work management, the scope and scale can just be any size. Yeah, we had a room full of salespeople today and they were telling us everything that's not right about it. And you know, <laughs> most of what they said was correct. So that's part of the fun, right? We, we yeah. gotta make those changes. Yeah, and taking, taking that critical feedback and strive. Um, mm -hmm. So, same question, uh, current focus in your work, and I'll actually kick it over to you next, Dennis. Fantastic. And hats off, Garrett. That sounds like some really cool stuff. And I know that there's a lot of stuff that we could talk about that actually leads into some of the work that we're doing now. Um, so, continuing to grow our SIP program um, by taking our 24 course curriculum that we've designed to minority owned, women owned, veteran owned businesses. It, it, anyone could take advantage of this program, but that's our target market because those demographics can't afford the program that we put in place and we can't afford to charge less because we're a small business. So we've come up with a niche where we're, we leverage local government and we've actually become very good at it with working hand in hand with local government to identify the needs of the community and working hand in hand with the community to deploy certain assets of our program to those businesses. Uh, so we're looking to scale that. So for 2023, we're working on the planning and deployment now to grow it to a few more municipalities here around the Pittsburgh area to launch it citywide in the city of Pittsburgh. And we, we should be hearing back any week now from an RFP. We made it through the first three steps for the city of Columbus, Ohio. So we may be deploying our program across the city of Columbus, which is super awesome. Um, so one of the most challenging things that we're currently trying to figure out because I'm not a programmer, I'm not a coder. Uh, I'm more of a hardware guy. I built my first computer when I was 10 years old. I, I built NAS storage unit systems for our business. Like, I'm a hardware guy. And so I don't have a lot of experience coding. So some of the problems that we're solving now is aggregating a lot of the data that we're finding the first party data that we're, we're getting from our clients around these different communities that need help and all these trends that we're seeing and putting that in a data visualization format, right? So we we've collected the data. We now have to put it into a working data set to where we can visualize it so we can run different reporting off of it so we can show these municipalities, local government organizations, the impact of our program. And on the back end, building in an AI component where it can pick up on these um, predictive measures uh, to help recommend resources before things become a problem. Like, so we're trying to solve this really crazy thing without uh, so I've done, so it, Garrett was mentioning, um, I've worked with Salesforce. I was a sales guy for 15 years and, you know, working with SaaS and different organizations. We did a lot of SAP, like business one work. Uh, so I, 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 I know what I want it to look like, but I don't know what sandbox and where I want to play with the data. We're looking at Tableau, uh, going with them. Um, but that's probably something I should be talking and partnering with Garrett. So it's just serendipitous. <laughs> the uh, team of Avengers that Ryan has put together on this uh, panel. No, that's awesome. And it's it's funny. It's almost like you have a uh, an education, you know, uh, quality of life, business improvement kind of tool, but you need this quantitative measuring yeah. plus visual storytelling, you know, as right. part of your strategy that speaks to what municipalities want and how they understand the kind of work that you're doing in the story that you're trying to help them uh, well, understand. 
And, yeah. and I think, and I think so much of, you know, storytelling, right. The work that, you know, you do, Nathan, Dennis, the stories you're telling, I mean, it, it you know, storytelling, almost another way of kind of talking about sometimes is it's, it's kind of transparency, right? Like you're, 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 you know, you're being honest, you're being real about what it is. Right. And so, yeah, they, the story that they want to see is our jobs being created, right. Are, are some of these economic impacts, are these things happening? Um, and yeah, I think the whole story, the whole story, uh, being able to tell stories around data. I mean, I think we all know that's, there's, there's, it's only going to become a bigger thing. A hundred percent. And it's such yeah. a manual process for us right now going through, uh, having a person interpolate survey data. Um, and we make the surveys as binary as we can, right? So it's easy to like report on that information. Um, but it's taking up a lot of like human work. We want to find ways of automating that. And that's kind of where we are. That's taking up a lot of my nights trying to figure out because we don't have like that person that has that experience. And honestly, Speaking of transparency, we can't afford that person, <laughs> you know, that that because that those are very high end um, tech jobs, especially with the economic digital landscape that we find ourselves um, at Facebook, Spotify, Twitter. They're laying off some of the high like some of the highest folks out there, um, some of the best brains in the industry. And it's I know this isn't the purpose of the call, but this is something that also keeps me up at night. A lot of our friends and family that are out there in the tech space, they're being pushed out because you have some of the best brains in the industry being let go from some of the mm-hmm. biggest companies on the face of this planet. Everyone's getting pushed down now, you know? So it's, 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 mm. it's an interesting we're, we're, we're place. Shifting, that, we're shifting into the, the podcast segment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, it, it's all connected, right? It's funny. Like you, you definitely uh, all have related backgrounds, but very different, uh, you know, kind of focuses in your work right now. And just hearing even, you know, these solutions and watching everyone's faces light up with ideas. It's like, ah, okay, there's going to be a follow up after this. Yeah, I saw Uh, Nathan. He was like, oh, yeah. (laughs) um, And then same thing to you, though, Nathan. Uh, So obviously, you know, uh, Garrett and and Dennis are super busy. And uh, you were commenting before he jumped on at the end of the year and you're super busy right now. So what are you focused on in your work? Uh, you're talking about, uh, stories, right? We look at that. Those, the, and the, re, the thing you're talking about is proof stories represent proof. Um, mm-hmm. and, and the transaction and it, 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 the, the, the transaction layer is being, being replaced now with relationship layer. What is the relationship? Mm-hmm. Part of a relationship is the story. What are the stories we exchange? So, we we talk in currents. Our currency is stories with organizations. So what takes up a lot of our time is 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 helping organizations that want to look at binary things and want to look at a spreadsheet and help them introduce the idea of stories within their organization and stories to inspire, stories to connect, and stories to help grow and make connection. A couple th- couple things happen in organizations when you when you ask someone to share their story. It it makes you know that you care about them. And sometimes that's what people want to know. They want to know that their peers and their leaders, they care about them. So when the organization makes space and they ask a person about their story or who they are or ask them to contribute, the organization changes. The entire personality or the entire relationship in the organization changes. So making those little switches, and that's the collaboration. Work is a collaboration. It's a social collaboration. So whether you work in manufacturing and you're you're in, in the plant working um, or whether you're a knowledge worker or whether you're in the service industry, the relationship that exists between you and the work that you do and you and your organization and you and your customer, it's a social collaboration. Everything is a collaboration at that point. So we look at that those things as social collaborations. And that's a new way to look at the market. It's a new way to look at what we do in delivering video and stories. And it's a mashup with organizational development. So helping organizations understand how important and how critical it is that they they listen and they and they show proof and evidence of what's actually happening inside of their organizations. So that's what I'm focused on as the CEO of the organization. That's what I'm focused on on the outside to keep the organization afloat because it is a business, right? So what else I'm passionate about, I'm passionate about inside the organization is our culture and our collaboration. So I work, we are growing as a team. We are in, most of us are here in the same place. I'm in the office now and some of us aren't here. They're, they're, they're remote. So how do we collaborate together to solve these challenges for our clients? Are we, are we, 
Are we using Scrum or are we using Agile? What are we using and how are we scaling up those tools when we need them uh, in, in, a, in a hybrid work environment? When we're not synchronous and and I'm used to being synchronous with this work. I'm used to being synchronous and my clients are used to being synchronous, but now we've got a lot of people on our team that like to be asynchronous. And I want to do that later. And I want to have a, I want to do this today and do that tomorrow. So when you've got tasks that are assigned and then other people are waiting on the, the outcomes of those, of those tasks and those projects, how do you collaborate and set boundaries and set expectations. And that's what we're working through. The communication and the relationship and the collaboration and all of that. Uh, everything in my day is about those things. So that's where I spend most of my time. Nice. So um, just to draw on some of the key things that people spoke about there, uh, I heard everything from Nathan uh, and Garrett, you know, you both were talking about working with teams and figuring out how to make things run more smoothly for people and, and just amplify what they're doing. Uh, which, you know, see, like, I, I think even at the beginning, when you talked about your workshop, Nathan, seems like a simple thing or we, in our brains, at least we're like, oh, I know how to do that already, but is such a valuable thing. And, and it almost like you said, we need to relearn as adults uh, yeah. all the way out to, you know, talking about something that feels really abstract, like data, uh, which is actually just ever present in our lives and is all around us. And there's lots of... Uh, simple ways to access that, but as uh, Dennis was kind of mentioning there, it could be uh, difficult to come up with the right strategy to use that data to tell the story. Um, so I want to jump into something a little bit different now. So everybody here has either, uh, well, I know everybody here has worked with clients, but uh, just thinking about projects in general, and when you're doing that initial uptake, or when kind of the, the you know, it's almost like when the problem is being presented, or the uh, focus or you know point of the project is being presented and you're doing this information gathering to figure out what's the scope of work going to look like you know what am i getting ready to get myself into um i want to know like what are some of these key ingredients or maybe think of them as questions or bits of information uh that can help you have a solid project planning or uptake process and i'm actually going to kick this one over to dennis first uh, so, yeah, just thinking about that initial phase of like the project is just like a, a hint or a whisper. It doesn't even exist yet. What, what do you need to know and, and how do you go about that uptake process? We focus heavily on the why. Like, why is this project important to that organization? Why do they need it? So, for example, some of our um, video clients, some of our social media uh, managed service clients, they we've had clients come in before they want a video they want social media management services because they recently saw their competition come out with some new stuff that they're using so they're like we want that because our competition has it i'm like okay that's cool like i get that but how is it going to actually benefit your organization how can you repurpose the time that by the deploying us in a project that you would have done internally, how are you going to reinvest that time, right? We, we spend a lot of time on what the why is and how to take that why and convert it into business, like a business metric, like what, whether it's, you know, revenue generation, whether it's saving on labor, because not how we price everything, it's all um, like the value and the solution we're putting back into that organization. So for example, if we're working with a large nonprofit, it's not going to be the same price. And it shouldn't be because we're solving a much bigger issue, a much bigger solution. So I think the biggest thing that we focus on is why that organization needs a specific project and what is the ROI back to that organization? Um, because then that's going to help them think through what they need um, capacity wise to solve that problem, right? You can't spend $500 and solve a million dollar problem. Like it's not going to happen. So we have to figure out like what the capacity of the problem is and what needs to be deployed to actually fix that problem that there are the obstacles that that organization is having. And once when we identify that, then we can start working through the scope of work and what we need to uh, deploy an RN to be able to meet their goals and their why. Nice. Yeah, so it's almost like that little check at the very beginning just to make sure that what the, the client's even asking for is, is, is helpful or valuable to them. Uh, and then you mentioned also just like being able to uh, understand the scope of work in terms of your business taking it on, right. much less the price you're going to charge. Right, um, 
Uh, and then, uh, Nathan, I guess I'll kick it over to you. Uh, so same kind of question when you're at that very beginning of the project cycle and you're just in kind of like the learning phase, we'll say, uh, well, what are some key things that you do? <laughs> ambiguity, dealing with ambiguity. Well, first of all, I don't let my creative team know any of it because <laughs> they can't handle the ambiguity. It's too much. Uh, I was taking some notes while you were talking, Dennis. For us, you're absolutely right. And for us, we we say, I need to, what is the actual problem? So people come to us and they want the outcome. They want the thing. They want the tool. And I say, okay, what problem are we solving? And then I have to ask myself, do I believe them? Or do I need to talk to more people in the organization? Do they actually know the problem? Because our job is not necessarily the thing that we sell, the thing they pay for isn't really what we do. Um, our problem or our, our biggest our biggest tool is problem seeing. How do we break the, the, the repetition of seeing patterns and see the real problem for each unique client as they are and not go, oh, you're this, you're number seven. We just pulled off the shelf and help you. We want to understand and see the actual problem and see the problems that are happening because it's not usually just one. So that's the first thing that we try to understand. And then Gary, you'll love this. We document, 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 because it is not about the initial scope. It is about the scope creep as the project goes on that you have to navigate, right? How does this, how has it changed from what we agreed upon? And then who's going to watch that behavior and who's going to watch your client's feet? Um, and then the other thing that, that is important for us is momentum and accountability. Um, we are making something out of nothing a lot of the time. So how do we keep momentum and keep our clients accountable? And that's really what our clients do come to us for is to see the problem, to help them. They may not want to hear it, but it's our job to push back on them enough to structure the work in a way that we can bite it off and and, and complete the work and what metrics we're going to measure the success by. Um, and then we we they come to us for momentum and accountability because if they could do it all, they would do it all. Um, but those are the things that we really help them understand and do is, is the momentum and the accountability. Yeah, I love, I love that focus on drilling down and just kind of questioning even the beginning of the whole process if it's the, if it's the right fit and, and uh, ultimately serving the purpose of your client, which is why they came to you. Uh, and then same thing yeah, for you, Garrett. I know. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say it's a it's a it's a wrestling of control, right? And that's really mm -hmm. what the sales process and the scoping process is is a is a wrestling for control. Are you going to let me do my job? Are you going to mm -hmm. let be the expert here in terms of defining this with you. Nice. Yeah. I just wanted to throw out there, Nathan, I felt like I was in project management church because when you were <laughs> talking about scope creep in my head, I was just like, hallelujah. Because it really is. <laughs> it really, because if no one's monitoring that before you know it, and we learned this early on when we were producing a 17 episode project for a decent sized winery, Ooh. they... It got to the point where hmm. after we went through, you know, revision one and two, we do our revisions in different, you know, phases of the project. Um, and then they wanted something changed after they approved all of the revisions from the first phase that would have caused us to go back through all 17 videos and redo something. So, yeah, yeah we learned that early on. You have to keep that foot, you know, to the floor. And it's okay. We can change scope. But there has to be a cost associated with it because you're talking about adding another 100, 150 hours back onto us. And there's no way that as a small organization, we could just eat that. 100%. Um, if, I, if, I, if I had the little emoticon thing, I'd throw it up on screen right now. 100%. <laughs> uh, and, and Garrett, I know you've worked with clients in the past, but you're kind of in a different situation where you're working more with internal uh, projects and taking mm -hmm. feedback from other departments and things like that. Is that at all different when you're kind of doing this uptake or, or how does that look? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I mean, I, I kind of treat it uh, really all the same. I, I feel like I've become a better project manager having really kind of worked more on the sell side. And mm -hmm. now, I don't know, sort of if you want to say buy side, right, being in house and kind of working with, you know, your peers, right, your coworkers. Um, you know, I'm, I'm real big on kind of upfront, like telling people like, these are the expectations, like, here's the playbook. Right. In our case, you know, we're we use Scrum to to iterate, um, you know, and produce increments in the software. And so it's very flexible, but this is what we can do. This is how we can flex out. But these are some non-negotiables that we just we can't flex on. 
So, uh, you know, basically almost training them. And I think back to some of the best, uh, particularly, you know, on the, you know, when I was on the agency side, um, you know, toward the end, right. I, I felt like those first kind of initial touch points with the customer, like, Really, basically what you guys are saying, right, like sort of the why, kind of the vision, understanding that, understanding the pain points, right, doing a lot of listening. But I would say usually, and I know, Ryan, you were on the other side of the table on this once or twice, I would just do a training session. And I would say, look, this is how we do it, right? This is our process. This is how we're going to meet with you. Here are the expectations. Like, if this isn't going to work for you, then we're just not the right, we're not the right shop for you. Um, because this is how we're going to work. So if you want to kind of do some end or end arounds or whatever, I'm just letting you know up front, like, that's just not, that's just not going to work well. Right. We're, we, that's just, cause this is our playbook. This is how we go about running a project. So, um, I like to establish the expectations up front. I like to basically do a training. I'm like, this is how we run a project. Um, and then, you know, my team, everybody has to be, I would say fairly, uh, you know, expert on, you know, how we go about running a project, right? So no one's kind of saying something that's out of step with, with what everybody else is doing. Um, you know, and, and again, I'm real big on show and tell, right? Every time we have these touch points, these regular touch points, like you asked for this two weeks ago, here's what you got, right? Here's the result of that. Um, we're now going to do this next. I know that's what we said in the contract, but are you still wanting us to do this? Uh, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. great. We're going to do that because every so often you get the like, you know what? Actually, we don't need that now. Wonderful. Like, I'm glad. What What's something else that we can do, right? That, you know, will delight you or so forth that we can put in place of it, right? Like, let's not, let's not um, be hostage to this plan that we made up, you know, three or four months ago. If like half of this is no longer really necessary, right? Or relevant because, because the market changes, right? And I think that's the other part of it is, is that whatever, the, however we're running our projects, they have to be flexible. They have to be flexible because things are changing so much. I mean, you know, perfect example, COVID, right? <laughs> I mean, like, just yeah. threw the book out the window. Perfect right? storm. So, um, yeah. No, it, it's interesting how you all, like, we're, we're all in these industries where we have to learn technical jargon and understand processes that, you know, have taken a while to kind of master to some degree. But it's all coming back, or at least what I'm hearing is it's all coming back to, to understanding, you know, use some human motivation. Uh, being able to adapt how you're delivering messages to people, whether it's clients or your coworkers, to know that you're being heard and you're actually communicating and saying the same thing to each other. Uh, and then once you get into the work, you're just validating that it is working along the way, which uh, is why this uptake at the beginning is so you know so important to get mostly right uh, to be able to like move forward with everybody having bought in. To what you're getting ready mm -hmm. to do which is really cool so we're all just going to take we're going to skip everybody else's workshops just take nathan's collaboration ones that's all we really need we oh, work with people right i agree <laughs> <laughs> you know you know it no, and no one prepares you you know garrett you say that and i say my things then as you say your things and it's like yeah but there is still a part that you have to have a hard conversation with another human you have to mm -hmm. tell another human no, and you have to hold a boundary and it has to get uncomfortable sometimes. And, and how do you ever learn to do that without doing it wrong <laughs> times mm. and right. then being stuck? You're stuck. Then you are stuck because you didn't tell the person no, and you should have, and then you're stuck and you feel that and you, you're like, oh, I did it again. I, I avoided the work up front and now we're stuck i'm stuck and i've done it right like i felt that and i'm sure everyone yeah everyone's 100 100 because we avoided that rough we avoided that confrontation that right that, we avoided that opportunity to collaborate right mm -hmm. and to re renegotiate the line yep sharing is caring <laughs> 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 they, they, they just don't know it yet um, they just don't know it yet yes um, so with that, everyone, you know, obviously brings a lot to this conversation based off their past experiences. Uh, but we obviously all have had to learn things along the way. And, uh, as Nathan points out, sometimes we learn things the hard way, but, um, when you want to continue to learn within the path that you're on, uh, there's lots of different places you can go do that nowadays, right? We're hosting workshops so you can come work with other humans, which uh, is one way I really prefer. 
Um, but just in terms of trying to keep up with things, and as, as Garrett's saying, the market's always changing, COVID changed everything. Um, what are some resources or references that you personally use or ways that you learn, I guess, uh, that you might recommend to someone who's maybe just starting off on this pathway or, you know, trying to jump into these spheres? So uh, I think I'll start off with Nathan first on this one. Um, so, yeah, just thinking about this continued learning process and where are you going or how are you learning about the things that you need to know to continue to grow within your work? The, the further I get in my career, I, I mean, I've, I've had a tremendous number of um, mentors and, and people that I have just like attached myself to their hip and, and soaked up everything I can watch their body language, watch the way they, the way they wrote emails. What did they really mean and good behaviors and bad behaviors. And I've tried to learn and we've lost some of that. We've lost some of that without an apprenticeship. We are a mirroring animal as humans we need to mirror that stuff so um we don't necessarily accept some of the trades we don't follow people around but when i learned how to be an editor it was a trade then and i did have to sit next to somebody and i had to watch them work and navigate collaboration navigate client conversations and i sat there with them for hours on end and just observed them and multiple people so i was i would learn that this is a framework for me um, but that's the other thing, the other thing beyond that, then transitioning from a creator to a business owner and a creator, um, or creative, I guess, um, in, in that strictest of sense, um, is, is what is my framework? What is my framework for understanding what made me passionate about this craft of video editing of storytelling at the very tactical leather what level? What was my framework? What drove me to it? How did I become successful at these specific things? And then extracting that framework and then laying laying it, laying my framework of educating myself onto other things, becoming a CEO, running a business, running sales, doing culture stuff. How what is my way of doing that? And then learning to trust my own, my own instincts in that space. Um, and then the further I get in my career, uh, there's some really amazing podcasts out there and books. Like I ferocious when it comes to reading, just on the treadmill, listening, reading. McKinsey's got some good stuff out there that's leadership and organizational development and, and culture related and collaboration. They've got really good stuff out there. Um, Adam Grant is a good one too. Simon Sinek is a good one for me, but I try to document everything for me. Everything is about writing it and putting it on a wall so I can, I have to make it tactile. I have to make mm -hmm. it something for me. So I, that's part of my framework is I have to take it and I have to, I have to create it. I have to make something with it for myself, uh, whether it's a collage or just a writing, writing it down. But the, I'm, I'm tapping my framework for me, my framework, um, taking a step back from just doing the work and thinking about how I take in information and how I transfer it to what I'm doing um, was important for me. Right. So, so frame, frameworks are tremendous for understanding yourself and others. So taking time to reflect, but also getting the thoughts, the questions, the ideas out of your head to someplace useful, whether that's that conversation with a mentor or actually yeah. being able to write it out so that it can live and and, and do something and not just give us all anxiety. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. For me, it's about talking out loud. For me, it's about working out loud. I mm -hmm. like to work out loud. It draws my team crazy. They all have, uh, most of them have green, green or red lights at their desk because I am a talk out. I have to work it out loud. I have to, I have to shop it and then work it out loud. So I have to get it out of my head and I immediately want to go and have an engagement with them. But now the, the, in the world of collaboration, they all have a stoplight that stops mm. me from going over and talking to them because it's that, uh, that, in, that invading into their space. Um, but for me, it's about, it's about working out loud. It, it is really about getting it out. Cause whenever there's an old expression, do you, do you, do you see what I'm saying? Right. Um, I'm sure we've all heard it, but that's really a ridiculous thing because you, we all see it differently. And until we actually make it a thing, and put it in the middle of the table. We have Legos here so we can build stuff until we make it. Oh. And then we can look at it and say, oh yeah, I was talking about that. Or no, that's an apple. And I meant I meant a pencil, right? So that working out loud is important for, for me. 
I definitely have people I work with like that. And I purposely make time and don't get annoyed. Like you said, like your creatives, because I know that's going to make something better happen. So hundred yeah. percent. And then uh, Garrett, I know you, we all know you're a lifelong learner. We can, we can learn mm-hmm. that from your LinkedIn page and all your certs and stuff you have on there. <laughs> so I know you're like going on different places like Udemy mm-hmm. and, and Coursera and everywhere else to learn. Is that kind of like your bread and butter or what other thoughts did you have on learning to grow? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I sort of bounce back between, you know, that and then for me, like a wonderful source has been a lot of peers over the years that I've worked with. And basically, whenever I, you know, uh, sort of find a coworker, right, even if their sort of job takes them into another city, like I had a coworker years ago, you know, eventually moved across country to Seattle, um, you know, or whatever other parts of the world, other businesses, I still try to keep in touch uh with with all coworkers right and just jump on web calls like this and so forth and you know i mean it's a friendship right you've been working with you've worked with those folks for a few years but inevitably it, it comes to a bit of like sort of a peer learning thing right like hey what are you seeing uh oh i went to this conference there was this speaker they talked about these frameworks right or this process and it's like oh cool or like yeah we started using this new tool at the company I mean, uh, I would say uh, almost, you know, a lot of what I've learned, right, has come at the direction of like really just people that I know in the industry that I used to work with and the stuff that they're now doing at the, at their other companies um, that has really influenced them. So it's like, you know, I think a lot of some of it's book smarts, right? Book smarts in the sense of, you know, a lot of this tutorial stuff on YouTube and Coursera and all that, um, that you have to have, there has to be some self-initiative. But I think there's also a ton of opportunities, again, like keep in touch with people that, you know, that used to that that are in your network or that used to be in your network Um, because they you can be you can also be vulnerable with them and honest and be like, hey, I'm doing this. And it's like it's just not working. Like, have you run into this problem? Um, You know, and like things like jobs to be done theories, you know, a whole bunch of stuff like has been just because an old coworker is like, yeah, we're using that. It's great. It's like, cool. Let me start looking into it. Yeah. And I 100% agree with that with the uh, it's almost like you can get the knowledge, but then really knowing what it means comes with application and being able to maybe avoid some pitfalls by having a few conversations with your network kind of tapping into it, like you said, uh, can almost amplify or speed up your own processes, too, which is which is nice. It's a, it's a nice mm-hmm. uh, way for humans to collaborate, we'll say. Um. And then uh, finally, last but not least, Dennis, you uh, you seem like a big learner to me. Seems like you, you you've certainly learned a lot about the uh, craft beer scene here in Pittsburgh and making cool collaborations happen. But uh, what is it that keeps you learning? You know, how do you keep growing and learning in what you do? I think part of it is that innate desire to consume information. On my wife and I's uh, first date, um, I drew on a napkin my theory of why I thought time travel was possible and the everyday things that we run into every day that you can just extrapolate on the physics to show like some of the theories. And it obviously worked because she married me. So (laughs) just having having that internal like nerdiness and just wanting to consume information. But we built our entire company out of Barnes and Nobles. Um, We set you know, a goal, okay, once a week, we were going to go in there, consume like the resources, the free books, the literature on, and we always pay, patronized uh, them by buying a coffee or a cookie or something. You know, we weren't uh, vagabonds. Um, we went, you know, and we would learn so much. And then one day a week became two days a week, three days a week. And we were always closing the place down. They always came over like, all right, Dennis, Sammy, it's uh, already 15 minutes after we closed. We didn't know we had headsets on. We were in books. We were taking notes. Um, So having that love to want to consume information, to make yourself better and making sure that you're getting it from different resources, right? Like both. Yeah. I don't want to dictate on how people consume information, but you want to get it from multiple sources, whether it's books, audio books, YouTube, online. The reason being is because every source of information is done for a reason. For example, YouTube is very entertainment focused information. It's a great way to learn and you can learn, but it's done with the focus of entertaining. 
Um, so there might be certain things that you miss on there. Um, so by getting your knowledge from multiple sources will help you. Mm. Um, and then the third big thing is you have to do it, right? Like you can read about how to do the perfect technique on doing push-ups. But if you never actually do a push-up, you'll never see any difference. You'll never see the effects of doing the push-ups themselves. Um, and part of the doing piece, it can show up in many different ways. One being what resonated with me was when Nathan was mentioning that he's an out loud thinker. And I've always been that way my entire life, even back in school, um, in college, the professor would, okay, you know, I'm going to give you guys the next 15 minutes back into your day. Go ahead. Class is over. I would be that person like, no, I, I still have questions. Like I need to talk through something and everyone would just like look at me, but I didn't care, you know? And then even now uh, I've had to be more cognizant of that part of my communication structure with my team. Cause like Nathan, I would literally walk up to their desk, like, Hey, can we talk through this real quick? And they'd be in the middle of a project, but they're obviously like, okay, well, this is your company. So I'm going to talk through this. And my wife would tell me at the end of the day, she's like, did you know you talk through, which is great, right? Like that's how we found different parts of our company, different courses, directions that we went on. But she's like, did you know, like you've literally talked things out for four and a half hours today with different people. I'm like, Oh no. Wow. And then that would cause me to have to stay up till six, seven in the morning, getting all my stuff done because I talk through different strategies too much because the stuff still has to get done. Right. Um, so, yeah. So part of it could be that talking directly to folks, but it can show up differently, too. We set weekly goals with ourselves with meeting with different folks every single week. It doesn't have to be potential clients. It could be people that we want to collaborate with and pick their brain and deliver value back to them. We have to meet with minimum one person a week. We have to be on minimum one podcast every single month. So you get this is checking the box for us. I'm counting this in that uh, vein. We have to be on a podcast because uh, that helps you know backlinking SEO strategy. Um, but more importantly, we uh, as a company and myself individual, we have been on hundreds of podcasts over the last seven years. We have led over 150 podcasts. That makes you a better communicator. It makes you more apt to listening picking out different things. And honestly, if I was to pick out any one piece has helped our growth as an organization, and it, it has been setting those meetings, communicating with people, being on podcasts and, and facilitating tons of podcasts has helped us so much because it's all about following those breadcrumbs, those, those conversations that you have that you don't realize how impactful they are. You might not realize it in the moment, but four months goes by and it's like, oh my goodness, you know, Garrett can help us. We got funding for this big project so we can now bring our data to life, but we have no idea which platform to go. And then now we're, we're working with six different teams across the country and be like, hey, Nathan, can you help us figure out an internal collaborative structure? Of, because now we're working with multiple companies. We've never done a scope of project this big before. You know, so it's all about following those breadcrumbs. Dennis gets it. All right. <laughs> and and uh, I just have to point out that Vagabond does sound like a $5 word you would learn in the books at Barnes & Noble. So <laughs> I, I, I believe that story. It's absolutely true. He's like, he could make this up. <laughs> uh, so no, so uh, that's really awesome to hear like all these different ways to learn. Uh, and to Nathan's point, like, you know, it's important to learn the way that you learn. Uh, and, and I mean, that's something that we think about all the time, whether we're doing these workshops or other programs or whatever. Um, trying to give the information in multiple ways because we get it. You know, it, it might fly over your head the first time, but hopefully by the fifth time it's been said and you've done some application to Dennis's point, um, you're actually picking it up and the light bulb's going off and you're finding some way that it brings value to what you're trying to do. Um, so I, mean, I think, not, oh, and, go ahead. And not the... Not, not to, you know, uh, throw a, a little bit more light on or more light on the collaboration aspect of this, but I will. Uh, I'll prompt my workshop. Uh, learning <laughs> is a collaboration, especially in this country, because communication and, and education is a two way street. Just as you what you were saying is the, the educator, the teacher can can only accomplish and communicate in so many ways, given the time constraints in life. I mean, unless time travel really can happen, but. That's outside oh, of this conversation. It can, it can but we'll <laughs> talk later. But it's on the receiver too to map the information to them, right? So this this is a collaboration and understanding, even in non, even in social cues and how, how we understand and learn from each other. It is a collaboration still. So, 
There. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> with collaboration, that's the chance I get. <laughs> I mean, we, we, we need the humans to do the things. We get it. Yeah. We get it. Um, so I think we have time for one more question. And this is, uh, you know, really just thinking about when, you know, to, to people that are maybe once again new to these sorts of topics, uh, maybe they're doing their own business, maybe they're in an entry level role or thinking about, you know, shifting industries or whatever. But really thinking about um, what things should people not worry about so much uh, when they're really getting started, because there is a plethora of information that you guys have pointed out online to kind of learn about things. Maybe they're following someone on social media and they're watching the way that they do things and their their you know anxiety. I don't measure up imposter syndrome, all the words. Um, so what are some things that people should maybe worry about less uh, as they're getting started? so that all their time and focus is not taken up by that. And uh, I guess we'll kick it back to you, Garrett, since uh, this is the final question. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. Um, you know, I, I, so I would say first off, like, I almost, uh, I remember years ago, like, whatever, 15, 20 years ago, uh, when I went to New York and went to uh, the MoMA, and I saw this early Picasso, and I was like, oh, my God, like, I can't believe like Picasso could paint like a, like a classic painting, right? Cause we're so used to, you know, his style, right. And what it eventually became because he found his voice. However, to me, what that illustrated, right. And so many of the great artists like him is that you have to learn the basics, right. And I think if you're going to do, if you're going to manage projects, if you're going to manage people, I think you have to learn the, the basics. And that is like, what are our project management best practices? Right. Like, how do you how do you go about collecting requirements? How do you write stories? Uh, you know, what is your tool that you're using to track? this? Is it Jira? Is it Asana? Is it Monday.com? I don't care what it is, but you need something. Right. And then how are you reporting on this stuff? So I think one is you got to learn the best practices. Right. You got to learn the process. You got to learn the tools, all that stuff. I think the other thing is uh, it's important. It's important to stretch yourself. Right. Like earlier, uh, Nathan talked about, you know, taking taking gigs, right? And like early on, maybe realizing that the way things were negotiated, uh, you know, that first initial meeting or two wasn't done properly. Well, you don't you don't learn how to hone that those negotiation skills until you make some mistakes. So I think instead of saying, instead of sort of being fearful about making a mistake. Right. Or saying the wrong thing or getting off to, you know, a bad start in a project, like just throw yourself into opportunities. And I mean, there's a whole ton of them in Pittsburgh. There's a ton of volunteer opportunities. I mean, you guys are entrepreneurs, right? I used to own my own business. So you can go start your own business. You don't have to be the next four to 500 company. Maybe it might be a little bit of a side hustle, but just go, go try things, go start things. Um, and I think it's also important to get comfortable you know, speaking in front of others, right? All the kind of stuff we talked about, negotiating, teamwork, handling conflict. Like these are all things that you're only going to learn when you're put into these ambiguous moments, right? Into these moments that it's not clear what the right answer is. And that's where I think the real learning comes from. And I would say, you know, the stuff to ignore is don't, don't over plan, right? Like, you go into you go into a project, you know, and there's the old Mike Tyson quote, right? Like, you know, uh, you know, a plan is a plan is only as good as, you know, until you get punched in the face. Right. And the reality is, especially with today, and it's only going to get more accelerated, is that things are changing so fast that chances are your plan was more or less just a good exercise, right? To think through various scenarios, but it's very unlikely it's going to play out the way you sketched it. So I, I think, you know, spending all of this time planning and instead of doing and acting, that's the thing I would tell you to de-emphasize, right? Yeah. Don't, don't put too much time to that. Nice. And so it's uh, worry less about starting and give yourself an opportunity to start. And to Do. Nathan's earlier point, uh, get the ideas out of your head. <laughs> Experiential learning Trump is, is, is the most important thing you can get, right? Don't spend too much time overanalyzing. Um, and just so we don't have to hear about collaborations, the final thing, I'm going to go to Nathan <laughs> next. <laughs> uh, but same kind of thing, Nathan. Uh, you know, Garrett's talking about worrying less about starting and the fact that the plan's going to change. Uh, what, what do you think people should worry less about as they're kind of getting getting into things? 
uh, what others think. <laughs> Just so people uh, don't think I'm drinking a beer. Yeah. Uh, what others think, because um, that's not important. Um, and then uh, I think that uh, the perfection, the idea of perfection um, is – is a, is a myth and and just where you start isn't where you end um it, it's a process so just getting started is important and then you know gary you reminded me i just read this recently and i i'm gonna i'm i can't remember the exact phrasing of it um i will look it up for for my workshop but planning is important but planning isn't the work planning mm-hmm. is the work to your point about a plan always changes when you get punched in the face. Right. Mm-hmm. But it, what it does is it prepares you. It, it's like, it's like, uh, it's like, um, it's like, it's like going to the gym. It's the routine. It's the discipline. It's the thing that creates the opportunities for you as you get into a project. The planning is, is just the repetitions and the, the saturation of yourself into the ideas. So you can, you can go where you have to as the project goes. So planning, plan, it took me a lot, long time to realize as uh, 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 as a creative that the planning is the only like it's just it's just the background, it's the ground yeah. really when you do something of where to go next, and and it's it's meant to be sort of broken in some way or to know where you were and where and where you've went like where you've went sideways and you've made those choices to make a to make a left or right turn. Hundred percent, I agree. Nice. And then, last but not least, Dennis, what what can I worry less about? I need to know. I have a lot of things to worry about. I would say, folks out there, especially everyone, like especially business owners, um, is your relationship with patients. You don't. Number one, you don't have to build a million dollar, five million dollar, ten, a hundred million dollar company. Like, get that out of your head. You gotta. You gotta. Build it to the point to where you're happy. That's number one. Number two, you don't have to do it in six months. You don't have to do it in a year. Actually, you're probably not going to do it in a year unless you have access to a large sum of capital or something along those lines. You have to be patient, especially with a lot of you know younger folks mm-hmm. out there. Gen Z specifically is extremely hard on themselves thinking they're – so a lot of our employees are Gen Z, and they – I, they think they have to have their whole life figured out right now in college. They're taking like two majors, four certificates, and they think they have to already have a full-time gig lined up before they're even a senior. And it's insane to me because they're putting themselves in a position where a lot of them are going to fail because they haven't even figured out what makes them happy yet. They haven't even figured out what course they want to be on in life. And they're going to put themselves in a box where they have labeled themselves, for example, as like this data analyst. And they don't even know if that's what they like to do, but they invested so heavily into that piece. So I think that could be translated to everyone, right? Like you have to have patience to, and and what's being tied across what Nathan and Garrett are saying to do the work, right? Those experiential things, you could figure out what makes you happy. So you can figure out what you want to do and what works best for you as a person. Now, okay, let's say you already figured that stuff out and you have a business doing that thing. Um, A big piece that we had to learn was the old adage, working on your business, not in your business, right? And Mm -hmm. that didn't hit home to me until I heard this quote you have to focus on doing the things only you can do. So if you're doing something that four other members on your team can do as the vision person, as someone who's leading, who's steering the ship, you should not be doing that. There is a skill set. There is a quality to you for building what you have built that only you could do and only you can work on. Those are the things you need to be focusing on. Um, so I get those are the biggest things. Uh, patience working on your business, not in your business by focusing on doing the things only you can do in your organization. Nice. So I, you know, I just love how all of this is talked about uh, people and relationships involved in work and kind of uh, gone away from some of the technical things and, you know, hard skills and knowledge that we all need to know. But obviously, like, these are the ways that you all have learned to navigate this and to make this better and to make this something that you're not only uh, feeling impactful in the work that you're doing, 
but you're also kind of like seeing that in the outcomes that you're producing or the way the teams are working together now or the way that your client has this amazing, uh, you know, way to tell their brand story and work better together as a company. So it's crazy as much as we all like stress about uh, the plan and, you know, what people are going to think about us and, and whether or not things are going to work out. Um, it, it just seems like we need to be doing more as well as, uh, you know, taking into account the people around us more and more as we get into all this work. Um, so with that said, I think we're going to wrap this conversation for tonight. Uh, so I just wanted to thank uh, all of our guests who are also our workshop instructors. Uh, so obviously uh, we have those to look forward to, to sign up for. Uh, you can check that out on Eventbrite. Uh, you also find them in the Warhol Academy LinkedIn. Um, and so we're going to have more of these conversations, more workshops coming up on different topics. Uh, but yeah, I just wanted to say thank you again to Dennis, Nathan, and Garrett. And I uh, hope you all have a good evening. You too. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. See you guys.